day four of the Outshine Virtual Film Festival for the Q&A for the incredible documentary, Surviving the Silence. I'm Jen Kritz, the board vice chair, and look who's here. It's Ebony Rhodes, our board secretary. Hi, Ebony. It's always so wonderful seeing you. It's great to be here for day four. Glad that we're about to have this great conversation. Absolutely. So Ebony, tell us about our community partner. Yeah, so uh, for, for today's Q&A, we have a great uh, community partner. It's Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Wilton Manors, Florida. So I believe we have a really great video to show all the important work that they do. The people declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall. Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. For if we are truly created equal, then surely the love we commit to one another must be equal as well. It was not that long ago that the President of the United States advocated for equal rights for those in the LGBTQ community. And as a nation, we recently celebrated those rights. Freedom-loving people celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising and the beginning of the present-day gay rights movement. But here in South Florida, we have another reason to celebrate. For nearly 50 years, we've worked to maintain one of the most complete gay libraries, archives, and museums in the United States. Begun in 1973, Stonewall collects, preserves, and shares the proud culture and heritage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, highlighting our significant role in American society. We're home to 28,000 volumes, the largest LGBTQ library in the world, visited by thousands each year. Hundreds of individuals, possibly you, have contributed their books, papers, and collections to Stonewall National Museum and Archives. We have more than 2,000 books of fiction, 6,000 volumes of nonfiction, 300 books in Spanish, French, Italian, and other languages. Hundreds of books relating to gay topics designed for youth and young adults. Nearly a thousand titles in photography, painting, drawing, and architecture. Over 500 rare books by historically significant authors, including many first editions. In our archives, we have more than 2,700 linear feet of materials, with an emphasis on the southeastern U.S., but with materials from the whole country, Stonewall's archives contain more than six million pages of gay history. We are a resource to scholars, historians, researchers, and writers. Items from our archives regularly form an integral part of exhibitions nationwide. Most of our holdings relate from the early 1970s to the present day. Topics range from feminism and lesbianism, vintage male physique publications, to national LGBTQ publications, papers from noteworthy individuals. We work to assure the histories of all within the LGBTQ community across all races and ethnicities are included. Stonewall National Museum and Archives operates one of the most important national education programs in support of LGBTQ children, convening an annual symposium and training program for school district administrators, mental health counselors, and teachers, ensuring the emotional success of LGBTQ students in the public school system. With our exhibitions program, talks and lectures, and collaborative partnerships, we attract thousands each year, enriching the lives of countless others. This is your organization. It is your history we preserve to prove we existed and educate future generations. Your gift supports our exhibitions, public programs, and educational offerings. It allows the opportunity to plan and grow, which inspires others. Visit us, become a member or donor, volunteer your time, donate your papers, magazines, and books. Preserve them for generations to come. Together, 
we will ensure that our history will never be forgotten. Let's we'll get right into our Q&A for Surviving the Silence. You will recognize our first panelist from our films, Breaking Through, the groundbreaking documentary she made on openly LGBT elected officials and bullied to death, which dealt with the horrors of bullying of LGBT teenagers. She is the producer, writer, and director of the film we've just screened, Surviving the Taught Silence. We have Cindy Abel. Our next panelist was a decorated army nurse with over 30 years of distinguished service and also the subject of this documentary, Surviving the Silence, Colonel Pat Thompson. We also have another subject in this documentary and founder of the Rat Pack for peaceful resistance protests on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Barbara Brass, who's sitting right there with her wife, Colonel Pat Thompson. Our next panelist served in the military before making national headlines by being discharged for being a lesbian and then was instrumental in helping achieve the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. She is also the subject of this documentary and the inspiration behind the film Serving in Silence. We are honored to have Colonel Margaret Kammermeyer here. And last but not least, also appearing in this documentary, we have the 22nd Secretary of the Army, the first openly gay head of any service in the U.S. military, Secretary Eric Fanning. Welcome, everyone. Hi. What a group. <laughs> My goodness. Real powerhouse group. So our first question here is for Cindy. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your film and on the terrific telling of this important story. Uh, we have all heard about these situations that happened in the military. But what was it about this specific dynamic from these women that caused you to decide that you needed to create this documentary and tell this story. And if I may ask you, how does it relate to you? The first question about what made this such a compelling story for me was I was hearing um, Colonel Pat and Barb sharing their story publicly for the very first time ever. And while they were doing that, I was sitting in the audience and I was blown away first and foremost by their love story. And I thought, wow, you know, so many relationships don't last. How do you make it last for decades when you have to pretend that you're actually not together? And then as I started to learn the story behind Colonel Greta Kammermeyer's story, which I already knew, and the role that Pat Thompson had played in Greta's story, I thought, wow, this is a love story set against the backdrop of unknown history. I mean, and as a storyteller, how could you, you know, not respond to that and not just be compelled to tell it? And how it relates to me is I love stories that show us people taking one step closer to being who they truly are in the world and people who find a way where there doesn't seem to be one. And the more I listen to Colonel Pat Thompson's story of doing everything she could, even though she still had to follow the military rules and expel Colonel Kammermeyer, she was still able to find a way to put things forward that would then allow Colonel Kammermeyer to be reinstated in civil court. And so that's fascinating to me. You know, here is a strong woman who did everything she could and put her own career at risk and did it in such a way that it got Colonel Kammermeyer reinstated and by doing so played a part uh, behind the scenes in the eventual repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Wow, that's great. I, I love the way that you frame that. And I love the story of how kind of you said that it was really the love story that brought you into this larger history and wanting to tell that history. So I actually have a question for um, for, for Pat. Um, I think this is such a beautiful uh, documentary because it really highlights the importance of how many individuals it takes to really bring about social change. Mm -hmm. And that every action and every kind of moment of courage matters and makes a difference. So can you tell us a little bit about the moment when you, re you first realized how um, important of a contribution you made, uh, not only to British story, but also to the eventual repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell? Well, I think I really <laughs> I don't think I really knew the importance for a while. And um, 
I finally got to meet her, and she welcomed me with open arms because by that time she did know that I was a lesbian, but during the hearing, she did not know. Um, so that that's the way the story was. It broke my heart to have to do that to her, but um, I was I received a lot of support when I got back home. Um, I I think I probably knew a long know what what the what's going on and, and my role that I had to play. I really uh, wasn't something I wanted to do, but um, but I knew that I had to do that. Thank you. As the story goes. Pat, from watching the film, this was your job. You had to do it. And yeah. the way you did it, if anybody else had been sitting in your position, things could have turned out very, very different for Greta. You really seem to enable her to have the ability to put together all of that evidence for the package that she needed to be submitted so that she could plan to proper appeal. and. It's amazing to me, and I am, I've been wondering this, did you realize what you were doing? Because obviously you were very deliberate in, uh, in, in delaying, this, um, delaying this appeal, or this, this case. Yes, I wanted, I wanted to delay until her team were ready. And I kept getting calls almost every day from the Sixth Army General's office, the cap one of his captains, would call me almost every day and say, uh, the general wants wants you to go on, on with that. Um, he wants the hearing done right away. You hear me? And I'd say, oh, yes, we're, we're doing the best we can. Thank you for calling. <laughs> you know? um, so that's the way I gave her as much time as she needed to get all of the um, information uh, and to get everything ready that she needed to get ready. So speaking of, I know um, for Barbara, for you, I know part of the beauty of the film is also highlighting your story and supporting Platt through this, you know, um, through the stress and anxiety of, of the importance of the job, but also what that, you know, how to do that while having to hide your love for each other and your identity. So can you tell us, in some of those moments of real strain, what was it that kept you through? What, what, what was it that kept your love alive, even with this kind of strain of having to hide for so many years? Good question. <laughs> well, when um, th that little adage, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder, I think it really was uh, pertinent to us because when Pat told me she was going to be going to Washington, D.C. for three years to work at the Pentagon, this was before we even had celebrated two years together. And I had no idea what that meant. Uh, would, would I, you know, we, were, we weren't as committed at that moment that she told me as we became over the course of time that it took for her to prepare and the time she actually left. And as you saw in the film, we did have our own little commitment ceremony. But for me, once I made that commitment and realized that this was my duty as well as her duty, uh, I just did it. Um, you know, I didn't think there was a choice at that time. I just did the best I could to keep a low profile, but I wasn't uh, totally invisible in my community. And fortunately, friends were very supportive and I kept growing our circle of friends here so that when Pat did come back and when uh, eventually she would retire, that we would have a beautiful, warm, uh, good-sized support group of people that cared about us and understood why we had to live the way we did. And, and nobody, I never felt that anybody would have us, except as you saw, and I think it was in the film that said, I thought she, somebody might inadvertently out here at her retirement. So yeah, it was stressful, very stressful. And in a way, when you're under that kind of invisible shield of, uh, you can't tell, you can't do, you can't anything. You kind of, it creates a little bit of shame. Um, you know, why Why do I have to do this? But I didn't think about that at the time. I, I realized it much, much later. 
I hope well, that answered your question. You bring up shame. And it's very interesting because the main thing that I kept thinking watching this was that you had a lot of strength and support. And I was thinking of this because uh, particularly you, Barbara, you grew up in the 60s. And you were, you know, you could have been a free spirit. And, and it seemed that your love was so strong for, for Pat that you embraced everything, even taking up construction and, and building this secret little passageway from your bedroom or <laughs> your from the guest room to the bedroom, really. But I, I just found this to be such a love story. And I, I have to say, Cindy, you really captured that very, very well. Thank you. Thanks. Well, it's what was in my heart, you know, from the beginning was really just being um, just in love with their story. And then, of course, I fell in love with them and they're so open and candid and were willing to say, you know, that was a really horrible time. And I was so damn mad at the military, you know, those kind of things. But always they would still come back together. And, you know, one of the things that we don't always talk about is how the spouses of the folks who are in the military are also having to be in the closet and give up their own life that they may have wished for themselves. And one of the most amazing things for me was to observe Barb, not only when she first gave her speech, but then over the course of a few years, even when the camera wasn't rolling, she was never better about giving up what was so important to her in order to be with the woman she loved. And I thought, wow, you know, that is real love. That's not just, you know, nice romantic love, but it's fierce love. And it's the kind of love that really transforms a life. And that to me was just in a nutshell, it showed the strength of Barb and it showed the strength of Barb and Pat's connection that has endured now for almost 40 years. I love that. That's great. Yeah. And that story we just showed, just really showed it from the film. Um, so I have a, a question for Greta, since we're talking about this film, and, and of course, you know, your story and your courage is is central to kind of the larger picture of what we're um, addressing and what Cindy's addressing in this film. I'm curious, in terms of your role in the film and kind of having your story told again through this new light, um, do you see a new opportunity of telling this story in a, in a in the contemporary climate and time with the film? How has it changed maybe your activism or what you see as the, you know, the possibilities? One of the things that I, I think when you take on a mission like this to change policy or fight for civil rights is that uh, you realize that you have to uh, have that mission as your primary goal. And uh, so when Cindy approached me about participating in this uh, sort of backstory of um, Barbara and Pat, you know, you know, as long as people were interested in history, uh, I think it really is important uh, as we sort of move forward so that we don't fall back to uh, sort of the, the horrors of, of the past. And, you know, we're living that today of needing to continue to remember what it was like before so that we don't give up or lose our, our rights that we have achieved. Greta, um, I watched an interview with you that's back from 1995, where uh, someone said, where did you get the strength to do this and to stand up for yourself and admit that you were gay in spite of the um, obvious uh, law in the military at the time? And you said, I think I had a delusion of grandeur. And your comment was that you had been in the military so long, you couldn't believe that in spite of that, they would actually put your feet to the fire and discharge you and it devastated you. And I just wanted you to speak a little to that because it's, we have come a long way as you, as you pointed out, and yet we still you know, feel like we're going a little forward and a little back. And I do wanna to get to Eric shortly after this to talk about that. 
Um, but but what are your comments about um, you know your fortitude and going forward then and now? Well, when I joined the military, women couldn't be married. Uh, then that policy changed, and then women could be married, but you couldn't have any children. Uh, then you were forced to leave, and so I saw and lived through those experiences of the past, and saw that the military changed its policies as they realized sort of the error of their ways. And uh, so it seemed to me that now was my time to speak out because, for one thing. I thought that the military would take care of its own because that's what I had seen in the past. I, I couldn't believe that they actually would discharge me after looking at my track record on something that was totally irrelevant to the situation of serving in the military. And uh, it really was devastating to, to then be sort of totally departed uh, after 25 years of service. Uh, and, and, you know, it, I still remember what that feeling was like and having to take my uniform off and hide it from myself because it was so painful. Wow. I really struck me that the pain of even you that your uniform is very powerful. Um, so, so we're also honored to have Eric join this call and this Q&A and, and lend your voice to this documentary and tell this story. Um, I just, we're speaking of courage and I'm just, you know, really would love to know, you know, where does that come from to have the courage to be the first openly the head of any service in the U.S. military in such an important role? How, how did you muster that? Well, I don't, I don't think it's the same um, courage that Greta displayed because I, I came to Washington right out of college, went to the Hill, worked for the Armed Services Committee and, and found my way to the Pentagon at the start of the Clinton administration and I just did my job and worked up the Pentagon ladder one rung at a time, particularly in the Obama administration. And the decision, um, you know, I was out in the Clinton administration, so certainly in the Obama administration, but but nobody really cared when I was a young aide and the decision about whether or not to publicize it wasn't really mine by the time I was nominated for the undersecretary of the Air Force and then secretary of the Army job. So in some ways it was easier for me because I didn't really have a choice. It was a part of my story. It was a part of something that the media wanted to make into a story. And it made it easier for me because, you know, as anybody in our community knows, you don't have a coming out moment. You have Multi, it never ends. You have multiple opportunities in your life. And when it's um, sort of blasted across the headlines, it takes care of a large part of the audience to let, let them know that you're gay and then you just get on your job. Yeah, and that is very, very true. And Greta really paved the way in many senses for many people in the military. Um, it's, it's astonishing. And I said this earlier when we, before we went live, uh, Greta, the impact that you've had on all of us is so tremendous. We're absolutely a legend. And, you know, it's to learn now about Pat as well and how the two of you guys really work together without even realizing it is, is spectacular. And we're so blessed that we have your film for our festival. So, and Cindy, thank you for, for pushing this together for us. So. So back to back to Eric. Eric, uh, I saw an interview with you where you stated that change is never fully linear, but over time it moves in the right direction. Which uh, I believe you were referring to the current administration, and yet, um, you know, and how it might relate to trans in the military. And I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that, if you would. Well, that that is certainly the most the more immediate thing, but. Greta just said something really interesting that when she joined the military, you couldn't be a woman and be married. And in fact, you fast forward to the early 90s, at the start of the Clinton administration, the Commandant of the Marine Corps issues a directive, which he was very quickly made to rescind, that says they're not going to enlist young Marines who are married because that's too much of a, of a burden, a financial burden in particular, and they need to focus on their job. So we do see progress, you know, it zigs, it zags, it's two steps forward, it's one step back, and we're certainly seeing it with, with transgender service. And what attracted me to this film is, A, Cindy, we've known each other for a very long time, and, and when she asked me to do something, I say yes, um, and was happy to be a part of this. But, you know, th there's decades of, in the military, think about it, integrating the military, don't ask, don't tell, 
opening up all positions to women, uh, transgender service, religious accommodation for Sikhs and Muslims. And sometimes you move forward a little bit and sometimes you get blocked and we're seeing that with transgender service. But what I like about this film is one of the most important things in making progress is humanizing it with personal stories. And it made an enormous difference. I came to Washington before Don't Ask, Don't Tell existed. I was in the Pentagon, was created. I was in the Pentagon, was repealed. And you know, you can figure, you can say how long did this did this debate really take place before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was was fully repealed? And I think it was let's say four decades. And that was a process of humanizing it because gays and lesbians were always serving. African-Americans were always serving. Women were always serving. It's not deciding whether they can serve. It's up to the policy to reflect the reality. And, and that was an important part of the transgender issue too. And what this administration has done to, to move backwards on that, I think has actually raised the profile. And for a lot of Americans has, has made this an issue of patriotism. Here are people who, who wanna serve. Who are we to question uh, if they can do the job, whether or not they should be able to, to make that commitment to their country. Absolutely. And I love that you kind of brought it back to humanizing and how important it is that that's so much a part of the work. So again, Cindy, you're putting together this story and choosing to tell it through the love story and kind of bring that out. So I just kind of have a question about humanizing. I'm, I'm really curious. We're talking about change over time. And so I know for, for Pat and Barbara, you kind of lived this in your lifetime how much change has happened. Um, I'm curious, do you still live in the same house that is in the, in that you did all that work? And you know, Jen and I were kind of talking about how beautiful of an um, analogy it was, kind of the secret door that you had between your bedroom and maybe the closet and being in the closet. So I was curious, what about your neighbors? I, I think, was it like being out now and having your story out there in a, in a documentary and, and being so public? How has that changed kind of for you personally in your own home and in your own life? I love it. <laughs> I love I love that we can be. I, I remember one time a gentleman that lived across the street came into our yard, and then Barb and I were out there, and he said, "What? Uh, what is the relationship between you two women?" He was really curious, and I looked him in the eye and I said, "We're sisters." And he threw his hands in the air. And he said. I knew it. That's what I told him. That's what I told him. When he went home, happy, but let me tell you today, I would tell him the truth. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we had to protect ourselves. And by lying, that's, that was the way I did it. And we, we do live in the same house. It's getting um, bigger all the time because we don't need so much space. We don't need so much stuff. And I think, uh, as I see it, uh, the first 30, 30, 40 years of your life, you collect a bunch of crap and you love it and you think it's important. And then you start figuring out ways to disseminate it out to the world. And, you know, as lesbians who don't have children, we don't have uh, a great line of um, inheritors. Uh, our family doesn't need really anything of ours and who probably doesn't want anything of ours. So I'm spending time right now in, in this uh, lockdown with COVID, trying to do that, trying to find things that we don't need anymore, but also finding my time to do what I love doing, which is uh, the creative aspects of, of rebuilding this house, which we have done 95%, 99%. And I have uh, deferred maintenance projects that I've put on the back burner for five or more years with uh, my activism and the film and all of that. So this is my time to enjoy, do what I want to do, uh, not get dressed, not go anywhere. Uh, I love it. And so our yards are starting to look better. I, I coined the term for myself, yardening, because it's all of the above. It's, it's plants, it's re reconstituting what's been out there that's turned into a jungle. And uh, little bits and maintenance pieces on the house uh, are always demanding. But yeah, it's it's a good time for me personally to be um, in a lockdown. And I've also been making masks for giveaway to the public and to friends and to family. So for me, it kind of came as a, at a good time because I was really tired of being a full-time activist. And we, what we did was to go to every meeting in our in our world here. We were out um, at every protest. 
uh, we had a two twice a week protest that, that I organized. So this is relaxing for me. Um, take away the, the reason, of course, but it is it's a great time for me and and um, does doesn't need a lot of work, but it just does need constant maintenance. So yeah, we're we're still here and we love it. Barbara, you say at the beginning of the film that you always, you didn't want to be in the military, but you always had been told you have so much potential. <laughs> and it's such, you know, it's such a great piece that, that Cindy places in there right at the beginning. And at the end, you see all of the activism that the two of you are doing together. And do you feel um, that this is tying in with that potential of which you were always being told you had? Yes, yes, I do feel that way. I do. I definitely do. And I think that the activism was one aspect of the potential that I never expected to, to follow because I didn't know what that meant as, as a young person, uh, as a child. But um, now I can feel what it means to, to live your potential. And for me, it is what I'm doing now. It's what I've been doing for the last five to ten years but it's getting more focused. <clears throat> I'm very involved in activism. Uh, most of it, and I guess all of it is online. And I do still send out my Rat Pack email and people are getting out there, the ones who feel safe enough and they're lining up and, and showing, uh, protesting like you see in the pictures right now. But they know that we are locked down and uh, I'm happy with that. The, uh, the way that I, fulfill my potential, as I just told you, is to get out there and, and have fun in my yard and, and my house and my shop and all those things. If I don't have a day to do that, um, Pat can tell. <laughs> and, and we've had a huge heat wave here. I mean, it's been 105, almost to 110. She said, you can't go out there. And that was before the fires. I said, well, yeah, just maybe for an hour. Um, so I figure out a way to cool off. I can just pressure washer and I, I <laughs> start washing stuff that needs to be cleaned and in, in the process I kind of douse myself and it cools me off and I, I can do a couple of hours but it makes me feel so much better to do something like that and it makes me feel better that I've lived up to the potential in the activism as well. Greta are you also doing some uh, Marie Kondo uh, house tidying yourself? <laughs> I'm working on playing guitar and writing. You know what? We were watching that. Uh, Ebony and I were looking at your website and we were listening to some of your album. Do you want to tell us about how you got going uh, as a singer songwriter? Not necessarily. This year is on the film. You know, the one thing I would like to say is that. Uh, you know, the, the films, both Serving in Silence and Surviving the Silence, are reflecting our stories, but also that we are, we were fortunate enough to have people who cared enough uh, and wanted to tell the story. But behind the scene are thousands of people who went before us. They are the ones who did not have the legal teams, or they didn't have the case that just was going to be the one that could set precedence, uh, or... Uh, you know, the pieces didn't fit together and, and sacrificed tremendously uh, both during the time before Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the 14,000 that were di discharged during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So we may get some credit, but that's because people thought that we had compelling stories to take. So I thank the filmmakers for making that possible. And on, on my on my side, of course, was uh, Glenn Close and Barbara Streisand, so I can name drop. <laughs> Do you mind telling us a little bit about um, about that process? Because as I mentioned before we started, um, a lot of us found out about you less so through the news and more through the film. And those, you know, and that inspired a lot of us to go and find out more uh, through the news. And I think that's part of the power of filmmaking is that it really brings these stories to light for, for a broad audience. Well, there was a lot of notoriety around my case and my discharge here in, here in Washington State. Uh, and um, because of that, uh, you know, 
uh, Randy Schultz, when he was alive, uh, had a big story in the San Francisco Chronicle. And ultimately, I was contacted by Barwood Studio and uh, ended up um, speaking with Barbara Streisand, who said, wouldn't you like to have your life story told to 25 million people on television? And I said, no, not particularly. <laughs> And, you know, when you think about it, it's very private, and it certainly was then. Uh, and the thought of, of having to have my life story told uh, in the news was uh, just, just outrageous to me personally. And yet what she said was, I think that this is the most important social issue of the decade, uh, at which time, you know, it was, you know, I sort of stepped back and said, you know, as long as it's done with integrity, and, uh, and you know, my story is so many people's story, and so that's how how it evolved from there. Well, you know, I think speaking to your point, Greta, that there were so many other individuals um, that have been a part of this journey and this road, and that you know, your story was the one that was you know captivating and kind of caught on. I'm curious with Eric, you kind of mentioned that as well, that you feel like you're, um, you're coming into having this notoriety for being openly, you know, gay and out was kind of something that you just were kind of set up by, you know, the current climate to, to just kind of come into that role. I'm curious for you, who has been an inspiration to you or other, other people that you've encountered being able to be um, in such a uh, highlighted role that may be an inspiration or have offered words of wisdom? Well, certainly a lot of people came before me and there are a lot of people paving the way now and building on, on what all we did. I mean, it really takes, um, you know, it's that's that linear step by step by step. Um, but yeah, there was actually a, a very local inspiration for me when when I first got to Washington, lived on Capitol Hill here in D.C. Um, across the street from me was a Navy lieutenant who was an aviator. And he was discharged, much like Greta, he was discharged twice. He was discharged or discharged before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, reinstated by a federal judge, and then, and then um, discharged after Don't Ask, Don't Tell was created. And he and his boyfriend, now his husband, lived across the street from me. And as I was sort of struggling with working in national security, being closeted, watching what a lot of people were going through and, and figuring out, you know, what do I need to do? Um, as an individual and what's the future for me, I was just kind of inspired by getting to know these guys and the lives they had being open in their relationship. They're still good friends now. And it had a huge impact on me. I remember just one night saying, all right, I, you know, I, I need to take this step. They've done it. It's okay for them. And seeing stories like Greta's, like Tracy Thorne, who was the lieutenant who lived across the street, um, it made me realize, and it's what I advise a lot of other people that, you know, when you're thinking about coming out, because it didn't, with the end of Don't Tell, it didn't mean everyone came out. There's still people serving in silence right now. Um, but what I realized is you've got a lot of people that support you and you know that already. Um, you've got a small group of people that are like the Muppets in the balcony and are just going to, you know, complain about everything. But there's this enormous population of people just waiting to show support and looking for someone to latch on to to do that and then another group that's going to be persuaded this isn't a big deal and you're going to help change those hearts and minds and what greta said on an earlier call we did is she's never met anybody who who wasn't no matter how difficult it might be happier having come out than not having come out and so i you know i i had my own experience and and how i was thinking about what would be negative about coming out. And I've come to realize that, you know, you can't make the biggest, most important decisions about yourself, your integrity, your whole being based on the worst case scenario of fear, which in most cases, certainly in mine, doesn't really come um, to fruition. If there was a call to action that uh, the two colonels in particular would like to suggest for our viewers and uh, those who will be watching this in the future and on YouTube, what would that be? And let's start with Colonel Pat. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that um, once we get out from under our current administration, get our democracy back online, 
uh, things that are going to, to really fall into place. But I think it's going to be a while before we can do that. But I have hope um, that that will happen. Colonel Greta. Well, I guess I, I would uh, certainly echo what, uh, what Pat said. Uh, I mean, we absolutely need to make sure that everybody gets out to vote. I mean, don't don't stay home. Don't don't react uh, by not voting because it is it is the most important election of our lifetime if we want to continue to sustain American democracy. Uh, but the other part that I guess I would say is the importance of living your truth. Uh, uh, because that is really what makes you whole in, in the grand scheme of things, regardless of uh, how rough the journey may be in getting there. How many years after uh, you retired from the military, Pat, did you come out? Well, I actually didn't come to my family until I was 80. Um, I've been retired now for about 25 years, maybe, maybe a little more. Um, but that was my biggest thing. You know, I always wanted them to know who I was. But I, you know, I thought about writing letters to them, and I just never could get it done. And so... Um, when I was back visiting, I did come out to them, and I thought I would be nervous, but I wasn't, and um, I was very relaxed, and they were extremely receptive. I don't think it was a big surprise to most of them. It's kind of hard not to be out when you're with somebody like me. <laughs> I, I never wanted to be in, so it was just a time and patience that it took to get to the point where we could both be out and be out everywhere. And uh, I guess, like Eric said, you know, it's not just one time, and everybody knows that it's always, always, always. Uh, you're always coming out, and the part about uh, we as individuals coming out or a couple or whatever is that our families have to acknowledge that they they are connected with us and whether they agree or not they have to decide whether they are going to be supportive and they have to come out too and that i think is for many people the hardest part um, for my mother it was difficult uh, i don't know about that's family personally because we haven't had much personal contact since that time but um and you, if you live in a small town and you don't see a lot of people and you don't have a lot of connections and they don't know that your uh, sister or aunt or uh, whoever it is is in a film that's going to be probably out there, who knows, maybe Netflix, PBS, we don't know where it'll be. And, and they could eventually see it. I mean, everybody could eventually could potentially see it. So then that'll be a whole nother level of coming out. And I'm, I'm fine with, I'm happy with it. I love it. I think the more we are out, the more we tell our personal stories, and that was my motivation for, for doing the speech we did when Cindy saw us, was that we need to share who we are, and we're we're not going to hide anymore. And um, I know we we've all come out now, and everybody sees us, and we can under the regime be be uh, moving targets. I have a uh -huh. nephew not speak to me or correspond with me anymore because he learned that I'm a lesbian and he's a kid that grew up in my house. Uh, I was there when he was young and there was a lot of love and he had just written me a letter telling me how much he loved me and, uh, and how proud he was of me. And then as soon as he found out that I was a lesbian, that did it. He's still not speaking to me. And that's very painful. It very, is. Very painful for Pat. And we need to see her in that kind of pain because uh, that's where religion has come in to stab us. Yeah, he's very religious. 
Yeah. Small Protestant church. Well, definitely, I know that's very painful. I think, um, you know, just from, from us here at Outshine, you know, we, we value so much representation and your courage to tell your story anyway. And we've seen across the screen comments from our viewers who are so appreciative of the fact that you're willing to tell your story. And again, to Cindy for making this film, I know it's been kind of a theme for you as a filmmaker to continue to tell stories and offer that representation. Do you have, want to kind of say, are there any other stories that you're kind of interested in telling as a filmmaker or just maybe your hopes for this film moving forward? My hopes for this film is worldwide distribution. And that's something that we're exploring right now. And, um, you know, getting, being able to reach out to Glenn Close and making a connection with her and or Barbara Streisand would go a long way, of course, in that. Um, also, you know, this film, my, some of my hopes for it involved during the festival run that we're on right now, that people who wouldn't normally have a chance to see this type of film or hear about types of stories actually are able to. One of the things I'm so proud of is that we've been invited to screen at a women's film festival in Herat, Afghanistan. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, wait, Afghanistan? Are you kidding me? You know, so the courage that these women have and the men who support them to tell these kind to tell, first of all, women's stories, and then to include an obviously positive, empowering lesbian story is just incredible. And so, you know, talk about changing hearts and minds. And you're right, I do believe it's so important that we have representation that people see us for who we really are, you know, the challenges and the struggles and then the victories. And that way, I believe people can relate and look at their own lives and say, okay, where can I take one step closer to living my life authentically? Where can I make a difference? Even if it's quietly behind the scenes, make a small difference. If someone makes a, a, racist, a racist comment or a homophobic comment or you know, things of that nature to just say, you know, that's really not cool and see if the conversation can go from there. So that is what I hope for this film. That's what I hope for all of us. And I'm just so honored to be able to make this film. You know, they say, oh, don't meet your heroes. You'll be disappointed. Well, I'm really glad that I got to. And so are we. Uh, we are so thrilled that you brought this important film to Outshine, Cindy. And having having all of you here, I mean, it, it's, it's such an amazing uh, group and such an important group and such an honor for us as a film festival to have you here. And Greta, Pat, and Eric, thank you so much for the tremendous service you have done for our country being in the military. We cannot thank you enough and we are, we're just so thrilled that in spite of everything that you've been through that you really did so much for us. So just thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. And uh, we I know we have a hard end date here, so we're gonna end with the um, trailer for this film, so Surviving the Silence. Thank you all, and uh, we'll hopefully see you in the future for another film. Great, thank you. Bye guys. Pat came over. I thought she seems nice. I'll find out who this person is. I don't know if I even heard about being connected to the military. I'm not really sure when you told me, but it wasn't something that I could understand how the impact would happen. We both were resigned to the fact that we couldn't be out and that we had to really protect ourselves. I was able to build a secret passageway that went from our bedroom and the bedroom that was supposed to be my bedroom. We felt that we had to be closeted in our own home. I had a lot of anger about that. And it wasn't only our society, but it was the fact that Pat was in the military. I was asked to be the first Army National Guard chief nurse. That really rocked my world because I had no idea how I would continue on in this relationship with that long distance. But I knew I had to go. It was the top rung of my career ladder. When I got to the Pentagon, we frequently could not talk 
We had to develop a code so that we could communicate when we thought lines were tapped. You were absolutely right when you were talking about the military. Just hate this oppression. It's hard for both of us. I love you for all of the tolerance that you exhibit. I get this huge cardboard box, and I started looking in it, and I said, Oh no, I can't do this to her. I applied for a top secret clearance. I made the statement, I am a lesbian. I said, the army is going to start discharge proceedings against you. And I was stunned, embarrassed, hurt. I had always believed that the army took care of its own. And now they were coming after me. I was sad that I had to be a part of that. Sorry that I had to do that to you. I wasn't ready to come out until now. Please welcome Pat Thompson.